In July of 1870, the city of Wichita was formed. It was basically just a small cluster of frame buildings and some dirt roads back in those early days. That's when people depended on their neighbors when fires broke out. That if your house caught on fire, you'd make a lot of noise, maybe fire off a shotgun or something like that to get people to come and help you. And there was, there was nothing organized. They had just, just nothing going on. People run up there with their buckets and try to throw water in this, that, and the other. The odds of saving those properties wasn't good. But nothing changed until prisoners burned down the jail in 1872. That's when residents decided something had to be done. So they formed the first volunteer group, known as the Frontier Fire Company. They had Firehouse Number 1 built at 220 North Market, complete with a fire bell to alert the volunteer firefighters. In 1885, another group of volunteer firemen started operating out of another station at 232 South Topeka. And eventually the two volunteer groups merged to become the Deluge Fire Company. When they were organized somewhat, they would have a rig, maybe something like this hand pump here, but it would be a wagon with buckets all over it and they would grab this thing and pull it to the fire and get to the clearest, the nearest uh, horse tank, horse watering tank. And it usually was a pitcher pump there. And somebody would start pumping the tank full and they'd run up there with these buckets, they'd dip the bucket, pass it on to the next guy. And you've heard the, the thing, bucket brigade. There'd be a bucket brigade getting these buckets to the fire. As the city expanded to more than 1,200 buildings, some three stories tall, the need for better fire protection became clear. The fire marshal, volunteer fire marshal, A.J. Walden, and they got the group together and they petitioned the city fathers and they established the Wichita Fire Department. They formed the Wichita Fire Department on August 23, 1886. Fire Marshal Walden, who became chief of the newly formed Wichita Fire Department, hired 16 men. Twelve men were basically on call. They were paid $7 a month and had to live within a block of the engine house. If they missed an alarm, they were fined $3. The other four men were full-time and were required to have had previous firefighting experience. They received $50 a month and had to sleep at the station. They worked uh, five days and were off one. So that's you know, five 24-hour shifts and then they get one day off and they're back at the fire station again. That's a long time away from the family. So you can imagine what it's like when you get home and you, you have to introduce yourself to the kids every time you come home. The fire department consisted of two stations, two hose reels, one hook and ladder truck, 2,000 feet of inferior hose, and 16 firemen. Station 1 was later remodeled to make room for two horses, a horse carriage, and harness. The department also added additional horses and equipment. By 1900, the department had 14 horses and 21 firemen. Horses injured or equipment damaged were grounds for dismissal. The horses were highly valued because they helped improve response times. But there was one problem. Hitching them up took extra time. So a Wichita firefighter by the name of R.G. Armstrong designed a quick hitching device known as the Armstrong Hitch. It was suspended by ropes from the ceiling above the horses. Oh, it was a very big deal and you can imagine how long it takes to hook up three horses compared to just drop the, drop the collar and go. And that's very significant because uh, they didn't have a lot going for them in those days anyway. Armstrong patented the design and made money by selling it to other fire departments across the country. Well, enough in two years to retire and never to be seen again. There are also stories of the close bonds between firemen and their horses. One horse got very sick in the night and he chewed through his rope managed to get out and came over and pulled the cover off of his driver and of course the driver got help for him so the horses actually had such a relationship with their trainers and their drivers that they knew who was going to give them help and could take care of them. But things started to change in 1909 when Chief Walden bought the fire department's first motor car. By 1918 it was a new era of men and machines. The Wichita Fire Department became trendsetters as horses were replaced with motorized vehicles. Old smoke eaters wept when they pulled the horses from their stalls. They knew it was the end of a special era. Wichita Fire Department was the first fully motorized fire department in the nation and the second motorized fire department in the world uh, of its size, you know, city of its size. This is very progressive. During this time, there was also progress with the pay scale. Starting firefighters made $65 a month. And after three years, they became first-class firemen, 
earning $90 a month. But they still had to provide their own boots, coat, and bedding. The city provided their helmets. The department had also grown to 40 firefighters who operated out of five stations, including the central station which received all the alarms and directed the other stations. As for Chief Walden, he passed away after 24 years of service, and A.S. Browniewell, known as Brownie, became the second Wichita fire chief. In 1922, Chief Browniewell uh, went to Chicago and studied chemistry and fire gases and building construction and new equipment. And uh, he established the Wichita Fire School. The latest methods of training were taught by the Wichita Fire Department. After returning from Chicago Fire School, Chief Browniewell established the Wichita Fire School at the Central Fire Station at Maine and English to utilize the latest methods of firefighting. Firefighters created a drill tower there in 1922, which included a stand pipe, fire escape stairwell, ladder, and safety net. The tower later moved to Station 2. In 1926, a presidential proclamation declared October 9th Fire Prevention Week. Chief Browniewell gave several speeches stating that 90% of fire losses were preventable. Uh, the reason they selected October 9th as the date because that's when the Great Chicago Fire started in 1871. 1926. It was also the year that Wichita firefighters learned about new foam techniques to fight flammable liquid fires. In 1927, Chief Browniewell died. He was succeeded in 1928 by H.H. H. McCall, who was nicknamed Old Man. He started a fire college which was held for an hour a day. The fire department bought a rescue squad in 1933. Firefighters installed the latest equipment, including portable electric floodlights and a boat. It's reported that the men assigned to the squad were over six feet tall, and all were afraid of nothing. 1934 brought national recognition. The Wichita Fire Department won first place honors for having the most citizen involvement during Fire Prevention Week. 1939 was a year of more improvements. Two-way radios were added so firefighters no longer had to find phones to report fire conditions, and windshields were added to all fire trucks. In 1944, the Wichita Fire Department earned first place honors, again during Fire Prevention Week. The department also received the Grand Award and received a trophy cup from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. 1947 is remembered as the year when six Wichita firefighters were sent to Woodward, Oklahoma to help out after a tornado hit. The 40s also saw several leadership changes with four fire chiefs. P.M. Doc Wendell, who went by Doc, was chief from 1941 until 1942 when he died of an accidental fall. Ira Martindale served the following year and then retired. Clarence Brown was in command from 1944 through 49 when a heart attack killed him. F. Eldon Wood was the next chief. He held the position for 11 years. In the mid-1950s, firefighters moved the drill tower again over to station number 8 at 3rd and Wabash. It remained there until 1967, when a new tower was built at 31st and Oliver, now the site of the Wichita Fire Academy. We have a state-of-the-art uh, burn facility there where we can build our own fires, uh, we can create uh, rescue and search uh, scenarios that just weren't possible uh, with, with the previous equipment. 1954 marked the start of a new fire inspection policy for businesses, which allowed firefighters to become more familiar with buildings in their areas. Home inspection started in 1958, which helped reduce the number of house fires. The 1960s brought more change through the eighth chief, Tom McGoy. He divided the department into three divisions, administration, operations, and fire prevention. Two months after his arrival, he bumped firefighter pay up to $467 a month. He was an innovator. He was uh, a modern-day chief in an old uh, era. And he uh, had the fire department and the fire service best interest at heart. Chief McGoy also bought new equipment and improved conditions at the fire stations. He uh, instituted, to some degree, uh, an apparatus replacement program, uh, which we were in real bad need of new apparatus. and. Uh, he also had a feeling for the stations and the, and the men. He uh, made a, uh, an attempt and was uh, effective in upgrading the stations and getting new equipment, a few air conditioners. We didn't have any air conditioning in the stations. However, the firefighters were not as appreciative of one new life-saving tool, 
They had a few air packs around, and you were a big sissy if you wore one. You had to be a tough firefighter and eat smoke or you weren't any good. Well, as the years progressed, we got more sophisticated uh, air equipment and air packs. Over time, advances in healthcare allowed one piece of equipment to be removed from fire stations. The iron lung was no longer needed after the polio vaccine was licensed in 1962. The iron lung was a big cylinder. They put them in an airtight cylinder from the neck down and it would breathe for them. So I can remember even when I came on the fire department in 1968 that at station nine, we had a spare iron lung in case one of the hospitals or someone who was on an iron lung at home, in case theirs broke, the fire department would respond taking this huge iron lung to their house and setting it up for this, this person so they could continue to breathe. After that service ended, the firefighters still stayed busy. During the 60s, Wichita grew by 20 square miles. Other fire stations were added to handle the demand, including one at the municipal airport. The department also expanded. In 1962, the arson unit was born. Three firefighters were assigned to full-time fire investigation duties. Then in 1965, the fire department experienced its most devastating plane crash. A KC-135 tanker had engine failure shortly after takeoff from McConnell. The plane crashed into a northeast Wichita neighborhood, causing an explosion that rocked the city. It was uh, January the 16th, 1965. We just had finished our morning, Saturday morning cleanup, which was extensive cleaning of the station. And uh, heard an explosion. Uh, I felt it also the explosion and uh, it knocked the power out uh, at the station. Firefighters immediately headed for the crash site at 20th and Pyatt. The explosion was monstrous. It tore things up. The scene, it was horrific. It was terrible. We only saw a couple of victims. One very noticeable was in the front yard in a fetal position. 30 people died that day, including the seven member crew on the plane. Ten homes were destroyed and others were damaged despite the valiant efforts by firefighters and residents. We had lots of help. There was neighbors and kids and people coming in from everywhere to help us move the hose lines around. Those tragic scenes took an emotional toll on the firefighters. But it was uh, one of those things that uh, imprinted in my mind, uh, never forget. The Wichita Fire Department will also never forget the Yingling Chevrolet Fire on November 21st, 1968. It was the night they lost four of their own. Uh, witnesses said they could see the chief and the guys in there, that they had so it's such little warning. They turned, took one step, and it was on them just that fast. They didn't move three feet before they were under debris. Fire Chief Tom McGoy, Chief Fire Inspector Merle O. Wells, Firefighter Mischler and Firefighter Austin died when the roof of the dealership in English and Topeka suddenly collapsed and trapped them under burning debris. People were walking in and out. There, was, uh, there wasn't any smoke down in that section. The fire was up above in a, a storage area and in the roof, and they didn't have that much warning. And they were inside and getting ready to open up to get to the fire on the inside when the roof fell in and, and trapped, and not only trapped and killed those four, it injured several more. And a lot of narrow escapes. Uh, one firefighter, John Coslett, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, lost his helmet, and we have it upstairs in the museum where his helmet fell off in there and it's half melted from the, from the heat of the fire, but he managed to get out safely. Another firefighter who was known to stretch a story a long way uh, told the truth this time, and they, the witnesses said as he dove out the door, the roof clipped his heel on his way out. So it was very, very close for him. It was also a close call for the men standing on the roof. We got up to where the ventilator was, we started shooting water down in it, and uh, I had eight men with me, and they were taken, and uh, doing all right until Aerial 2 set up their ladder. They had a, a play pipe on top of the aerial, in other words, a big nozzle. And they started shooting down it, but they was controlled it with a uh, rope. And they were just knocking us down, just knocking us everywhere. And so I said, let's get off this roof. I said, we well, can't do no good up here with them knocking us down. Because that two, two inch nozzle or inch and a half nozzle, it'll knock you down and hurt you. So got off there onto the other boat, onto the other 
bow tie roof and the and she went. I mean, in went the roof. And at that time, I never had a thought about anybody being under it because there was so much fire below me. I assumed that they was, you know, down below. But anyway, I, there were four men under there. And I can remember walking in there on this roof and knowing there are firefighters below this roof that I'm walking on. And I, I, I was trying to think, how can I walk lightly so I don't hurt them? You know, they were dead, obviously, with tons of roof on them, but you just feel really bad walking on, on your friends. It was one of the many traumatic moments from the Yingling Fire that make up a painful chapter in the Wichita Fire Department's history. If you lost four of your best friends, what would it be to you? It was a terrible situation, and everybody regretted it happening, but we went on. We went ahead and answered alarms. That was our job. It was a very tragic fire a very big lesson but for me I always wanted to be a Wichita firefighter all my life and I had just gotten back from Vietnam two months before that and I had the mental mindset that you go into battle somebody dies and I think that's what pulled me through that. The Kansas State Association of Fire Chiefs created an annual award in Chief McGoy's honor for firefighters who go above and beyond the call of duty. The new fire chief did his part to heal and rebuild his department L.D. Carney was named fire chief in 1969. He established the fire chaplain program, fire service recognition day, and the junior firefighter program. A major achievement came in 1972 when Chief Carney and Captain Al Rose received the National Award of Merit from the Muscular Dystrophy Association of America on behalf of the fire department's annual campaign. The fire department raised $77,000 that year. 1975 marked another change in leadership. Chief Carney retired and Floyd Hobbs took over as the 10th fire chief. He moved the fire administration and fire prevention divisions to City Hall and established no smoking in public buildings. The fire department was on the move in 1977 when fire dispatch consolidated into central communications, which included fire, police, EMS, and the sheriff's department. By 1980, a new chief was in charge Jim Sparr headed up the department as the 11th Wichita Fire Chief. In 1982, the city adopted a mandatory smoke alarm ordinance for homes, which contributed to the biggest decrease in fire fatalities since 1970. More technology upgrades came in the early 80s, when computers were added in fire stations. They made it easier for firefighters to file reports and track data of importance to the department and the community. In 1983, the fire department formed the 15-person Hazardous Materials Response Team, or HAZMAT Team. This was a new concept for firefighters across the country. It had become clear firefighters needed training to be ready for these emergencies. The 15-member Wichita Fire Department HAZMAT Team pioneered the way. When we first got into it, we had no training, we had no equipment, we had nothing to get into it with. Larry Mulliken was one of the founders of the HAZMAT Team. He says their first lesson in chemicals came from Wichita State. They soon realized a need for new equipment and a hazmat truck. But convincing leaders proved to be difficult, until a company in South Wichita reported a chemical emergency which forced evacuations. Uh, Jim Sparrow, at the time, he was the fire chief. The hazmat truck had already come up in the CIP discussions, but it was competing against a lot of a lot of other capital improvements and community block grant programs. And the commissioner said, oh, we'll table this and move on, because they thought they had higher priority items, which, you know, at the time it was. Well, Spar was sitting there, got a note slip that says, by the way, you know, we just evacuated six blocks of town to a hazmat call. We have no equipment. And I don't know who gave him that note, but he passed that note to the commissioners while they were having their discussions. All of them opened that up and looked at it. Then they voted, brought the hazmat truck back up and voted it in. That's how it happened. So it was really an amazing story of, of timing, of things that happened. It was just meant to be. But we got a new hazmat engine, and, uh, and it was, kind of, it was uh, kind of unheard of at that time, you know, getting fire trucks for this. And, and we did. We got our first hazmat engine, and we had to move from, because of the area that we got, had to write the grant for to get the truck, we moved from Douglas and Martinson to 17th and Grove to Station 10. Uh, the potential for a hazardous materials emergency in this region is enormous when you consider the interstate system, uh, the rail system, 
all those and the potential for a disaster to occur really pushed the, de the, de the department toward focusing on what we could do in those areas that, that would make it better. I'd like to think that we maybe were the pioneers here in Kansas because we helped a lot of other cities that came in here and wanted to know what we were doing to help get going. It was us and really Kansas City, Kansas. One year later, the fire department recognized the need for a technical rescue team. Members are trained to handle a variety of emergency situations. We did have a number of uh, people in the department uh, who were conscientious and dedicated to finding better ways to do our jobs, whether that involved uh, an extrication at a car crash. Uh, you know, here in the, in the area and in the city, we have grain elevators, uh, which sometimes put us in a position where we've got to have people operate hundreds of feet above ground. Uh, there are situations where they're underground. We have situations where people are in the water with the rivers that, that run through the city. The 80s also brought about a major change in the makeup of the fire department when the first female firefighter came on board. I actually was the, uh, the captain at number one station when the very first lady, Rebecca Downham, was hired and she was given to me to uh, make sure the program worked. But Station One didn't have bathrooms or bunk rooms for women, so precautions were taken. We put her bunk next to mine just to, for security purposes to make sure we didn't have any problems because uh, per the chief of the fire department, we want this to work and it did work and most of that falls to Rebecca herself because she was a good fire person. Since then other women have also joined the fire department and experienced success. They have one lady now currently on the department that's a division chief so that suggests to you that at least we didn't do anything on our watch to cause a problem and the program has developed to a very good Program. Meanwhile, a firefighter by the name of Lawrence D. Garcia was busy working his way up through the ranks. He made a name for himself as the chief training instructor. Then, in 1987, Garcia became fire chief. He held the top position for 20 years, until he retired in 2007, making him the longest serving Wichita fire chief. certainly owed a debt of gratitude for uh, not only his commitment to the city and the department, but for the many things he'd done during his tenure as chief. In 1994, Chief Garcia made a four-legged addition to the arson unit, a specialty trained dog named Ashley. That a dog's nose is about 200 times more sensitive than a human's. The dogs go through 12 weeks of intense training before reporting for duty. But the training never really stops. Because every day we have to train these dogs. They don't eat out of a dog bowl. Every kibble of food they get comes out of our right hand. And so every day we have to burn stuff. We have to spike it with an ignitable liquid. They have to go through the burned up stuff and find it and, and alert every single day. But the training is time well spent when you consider the success rate of the arson dogs since they joined the Wichita Fire Department. They've responded to 525 fire scenes totaling over $55 million in property loss. And the work that they have done has led to 105 felony arrests. A total of five dogs have joined the Wichita Fire Department. The original arson dog Ashley died in a car accident and was replaced by another dog, also named Ashley. After her retirement, Jody came on board in 2001 and was part of the arson unit until Bella took over in 2008. Bella was succeeded by Sporty in April of 2010. Other significant changes also took place under Chief Garcia. As the city continued to grow, research showed that firefighters should be strategically placed in different areas to better serve more people. As a result, six fire stations were relocated over a two-year period starting in 2003. In 2004, city firefighters and one city fire truck moved into the Sedgwick County Fire Station near Central and 143rd Street. The new partnership allowed the city to provide additional fire coverage in East Wichita. Replacing aging fire trucks was another priority. Really proud of, of our fleet. Uh, as we speak today, about 90% of the fleet uh, is relatively new and by that I mean less than seven years old. Uh, the equipment that you see on the streets, the, the fleet, uh, our equipment is unmatched. Chief Garcia also groomed another up-and-comer in the fire department, a guy by the name of Ronald D. Blackwell and made him the equal opportunity officer. It turned out to be a tremendous opportunity for me to help shape the department in some ways but also on a more personal level 
it was a real growth opportunity that exposed me to some things that I normally would not have seen. Ron Blackwell found additional growth opportunities in Maryland, where he led two fire departments. He eventually replaced Garcia as the 13th Wichita Fire Chief in the fall of 2007. Two years later, the Kansas State Association of Fire Chiefs named him Fire Chief of the Year, making him the first Wichita Fire Chief to receive this honor since the inception of the award in 1997. I'm really pleased to be here and very, very proud of all our people. I, I think having uh, cut my teeth in the fire service here and often having that, that dream or, or wanting the opportunity to lead this department and having that, that come true, this is the greatest job in the world, and uh, I, I feel blessed uh, to have the opportunity to lead a fire department in Wichita, Kansas. Chief Blackwell built on Garcia's work as he led the efforts to build three new fire stations which opened in 2009, including Fire Station 20 at Greenwich and Kincaid, which serves southeast Wichita. Fire Station 21 serves the northwest part of the city and Fire Station 22. Which is going to go in the, in the South City area uh, at Hydraulic and Dinker, which is a block north of Wassel, but it's an area that we have long had needs and, and we're looking forward to providing service down there. Three. A new era is underway at the Wichita Fire Academy training grounds near Oliver and 31st Street South. We are very, very excited about the opportunity to uh, build a regional training center uh, that could uh, really hi highlight and showcase our training here. Our department historically, some of our best and brightest uh, have been our, our chief training instructors and people who have been involved in training over the years. So the opportunity to enhance our current facility uh, with the burn building, uh, to create a um, classroom and an auditorium there is something that is really going to serve the department and the community well in the coming years. The new regional training center will house 25,000 square feet of auditoriums, classrooms, and new props for training purposes. The center will be used nearly every day by Wichita firefighters and firefighters from surrounding communities. In addition to the, the tower, which isn't that old, uh, puts Wichita in a position where we'll have a regional training presence for uh, fire service organizations and departments outside of Wichita that will provide a facility that is second to none. Community risk reduction is another big priority for Chief Blackwell. He's asked his firefighters to reach out to residents, connect with kids, the neighborhoods, and business owners to identify needs and improve public safety. Chief Blackwell also initiated a partnership with Northeast Magnet High School in 2009. Students have the opportunity to sign up for the four-year curriculum to learn about the fire service. We'll have students coming in as ninth graders, teach them uh, Firefighter 1 uh, and how to get that certification, uh, Firefighter 2 as a sophomore, uh, and ultimately they can get an EMT certification, which as things stand today, that EMT certification is the key uh, to potential employment with the city. The training will help students become the next American Fire Service and possibly Wichita firefighters of tomorrow. As the Wichita Fire Department continues to evolve, its storied past and the details will become part of the Fire Department's History Museum, designated by the state legislature as the Kansas Fire Museum. It's located at 1300 South Broadway and is open to the public. We feel like we have a jewel here. We are full, we're totally full, and uh, we need to expand. We've got three fire trucks that we'd like to put on display and we don't have room for them. We've got lots and lots of archives and artifacts and stuff. Expansion plans at the museum are on hold as the constant need for funding continues. In the meantime, Chief Blackwell will continue to improve the fire service and build upon the Wichita Fire Department's rich history in the years to come. We want to continue that, that legacy, that legacy of service, and commitment to the people uh, who live, work, and, and play here. And, and once again, it is an absolute joy for me uh, to be chief of a fire department that's 123 years old and getting better.